Hello everyone. I'd like to bring a couple of websites to your attention. The Top 10 Myths That Dominate Christianity. And it was written by Abdiel Freeman. Exposed. The Top 10 Myths That Dominate Christianity. Number 10. From Good Friday to Easter Sunday, can Christians not count to three? The centerpiece of Christianity is the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Many, if not most Christians, believe that Jesus was crucified on Good Friday and was resurrected roughly 36 hours later, in the early morning hours of Ishtar slash Easter Sunday. But is this what really happened? A close and thorough examination of the evidence proves beyond any reasonable doubt that this simply is not the case. Christ prophesied the following about the time between the crucifixion and the resurrection. And every single one of these points that he discusses is linked to biblical scripture. When you read this article, you'll find that many of the things that we're taught by our priests and by the televangelists and the ministers and rabbis will find that they have been misinterpreted. Unfortunately, many of these people listen to Satan. The Trinity Delusion While counting to three has proven difficult for most Christians, dividing by three seems to come easy, especially when it affords yet another opportunity to mix in some more pagan beliefs like Ishtar slash Easter into their mysterious organized religion. Just as Ishtar Easter makes a mockery of Christ's sacrifice and suffering on the cross, the Trinity makes a mockery of the king, ruler of the universe, whose name in Hebrew is Yahweh, or in English, the I Am, the self-existing one. Number eight, Peter the Roman. The foundation for both the Roman Catholic Church and her daughters, that is, all the Protestant religions which she gave birth is built on a lie that Peter was the first Pope of Rome. Simon Peter was never in Rome, much less the first Pope of the Babylonian mystery religion. And then the link, Revelation 17.5. The Roman Catholic Church claims Peter served in Rome in the capacity of Pope from 41 to 66 AD. Some historians differ on these dates, but not on the location, and that the papacy derives its authority by apostolic succession from Peter, whom they claim is buried under St. Peter's Basilica. But even a cursory examination of the scriptures, the rock solid truth, proves this is a complete fabrication. Number seven. As ludicrous as it may sound, this is yet another church doctrine that most, if not all, Christians believe. Sure, different words are used, and a pack of elaborate lies are being told and sold, but the end result is the churches have convinced their paying customers that it's not only okay to be a criminal, it's expected of them, and all that is required to sell this utterly ridiculous concept is the twisting of a few scriptures and the making of a promise they cannot keep to make everyone feel better about themselves for being habitual lawbreakers. Of course it begins with telling everyone it's someone else's fault. Personal responsibility has no place in organized religion because the two sides are mutually exclusive. Personal responsibility for one's own actions means placing the truth above all else for the common good no matter what and to do that requires keeping and enforcing the law that was given to us by the ruler of the universe to protect us from all evil and keep us free number six we are only human after all do we have souls like the churches claim we do or is this something else they have exactly backwards? The churches teach that we are humans and have souls, and that if we lead a relatively good life in their estimation, which of course includes funding their criminal enterprise, our soul will go to heaven when we die. Otherwise, our soul will go to hell. It is a well-known fact that all human life ends in death. So, if we are human with a soul, and it is the soul that moves on when the body dies, precisely how do we escape death? A human can never please or serve God, so why would God want to let hardened criminals that refuse to repent and return to keeping His law roam the universe? Number 5. Churchianity 
It should be as clear as a church bell by now that Christianity and Christ's true teachings are polar opposites. But nowhere is this clearer than in Christ's condemnation of the churches and their leaders. Matthew chapter 6, 1 to 13 explains this clearly. There is one good shepherd, one master slash teacher, and one mediator between God and men. So who are all these priests, pastors, etc., who are doing the opposite of what Christ teaches, really working for? Stop calling it Christianity. It has nothing to do with Christ. Christ told his true followers to go and make disciples of all nations, not Christians. Number four, ho, 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 Merry Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Sing along if you know the words. When we celebrate Santa and reindeer and Christmas trees and Christmas lights and Christmas decorations and presents, what in the world does any of this have to do with the birth of Jesus? Ask any Christian and they'll probably tell you that despite the central role Santa plays in all of this holiday cheer, they know the real reason for the season, don't we all? Materialism. Number three, will the real Israel please step forward? There are few, if any, terms throughout history which have been more intentionally obscured and more misunderstood than the terms Jew and Israel. These two terms are not and never have been synonymous. The name Israel, champion of God, or ruling with God is a title which has specially bestowed by God himself upon Jacob, the ancestor of Israel people. Jacob Israel had twelve sons, of whom Judah was the fourth. It is obvious, therefore, that Judah was one of the children of Israel, and equally obvious that the other eleven sons could not possibly have been Judah. Each of these twelve sons founded a tribe with the exception of Joseph, who founded two tribes through his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. True Israel, the two witnesses of Revelation, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob Israel, Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim, coming soon to a military theater near you, the Great Tribulation. As we watch the current geopolitical scene escalate towards World War III, between the United States and Russia, the East and the West. This is what the Bible says about these days. It will be the worst oppression ever. God will have to intervene for us to avoid total annihilation. It is, aka the times of Jacob, Israel's trouble. It is a punishment for Jacob slash Israel not keeping the law, God's law. The great Prince Michael will be here during it. Christ will be here during it. Elijah the prophet will be here during it. There will be a great spiritual awakening during it. Judgment Day and the fire will take place after it. And the truth about it has been sealed up, awaiting Christ's second coming. The greatest tribulation is not some future event. It is happening right now, all around you. The rapidly expanding police state the rampant injustice and oppression, and the imminent economic collapse of this totally unsustainable debt-based consumer throwaway society should have already gotten your attention long ago. And number one, the rapture, a fool's paradise. Another term that is found nowhere in the scripture is the rapture. The rapture refers to the theory that believers will be caught up in the clouds to meet Christ at or before his second coming. This theory is largely predicated on references about one being taken and one being left behind, the dead being raised and transformed, and being caught up into paradise. It is also accompanied with the standard arrogant Christian claim of knowing they are saved in spite of the fact that Christ said that no one has ever gone to heaven except for him. We are told that Christ will be here in a new body with a new name to publish the gospel, the truth of all nations, in the form of a little book, revealing the mystery of God before the end would come. Christ warned that during his second coming, faith would be at an all-time low, and with so many spiritually fast asleep, hardly anyone would even take notice of him being here. 
fewer yet would actually try to listen to and learn from him thanks to all of the false teachings of organized religion. And only a small percentage of those select few would stick it out to the end alongside Christ in the upcoming war being planned against him now by Satan's one world government leaders, aka the New World Order. All of the above references clearly indicate and require a physical presence, that is, a second coming in the flesh at the time when it is unexpected, like a thief in the night. We are even told that when Christ has completed his mission, this time to gather the elect, he will shed his human body he's been using, and the reaping will begin. It is then that Christ will be seen by everyone coming in the clouds as his true spiritual self with the heavenly host to separate the sheep from the ghosts. Please note well that when everyone sees Christ coming in the clouds, it is not a happy reunion in the midair. It specifically states that all of the tribes and the kindreds of the earth shall mourn and wail. Why? Because when everyone sees Christ coming in the clouds with the heavenly host to begin the reaping, we will know that it's too late to do anything to change the outcome of our fate. The best and only way to make the most of what little time you have left is to read and study and put into practice the survival plan, which is the little book of Revelation 10, 7-10, entitled The Way Home or Face the Fire by Jah. The title is self-explanatory. Those of you who claim to be saved already are wrong. You do not mark your own test, only the Lord marks your test, and you will have absolutely no say in it. The links are provided here for the survival plan and the way Homer faced the fire. It's a free download book. It's 100 pages. I highly recommend that people read it. I more than highly recommend that people believe what they read. Check out Hannah Michaels' blog, Keep Track of Abdel Freeman. The truth is here for those who look for it. Judgment Day is coming. World War III is knocking on all of our doors. It's so imperative that you get your soul in order. Get your soul in line with the discipline and the true teachings of Christ. All right, guys. Live in love. Peace.